Well, hello, people of God. It's good to be with you and to open God's word together once again. I want to turn together to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'll read chapter 1 and then we'll think a little bit about uh, how this book came to the Corinthians and uh, think a little bit about its background. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we read, this is God's word. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called, into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that as it is written let the one who boast boast in the lord uh, thus far the reading of god's word may he bless it to us um, this is a very important book obviously first corinthians um, it was written by the apostle paul uh, to the church in corinth uh, that's why we get all the names of these books it's really the church they were written to so the church in Corinth received this letter. Um, it's likely that Paul wrote this letter to them from Ephesus, uh, where he was on his third missionary journey, um, maybe around between 53 and 58 AD. So he's in Ephesus, having been in Corinth um, in his second missionary journey, where Paul stayed a long time. So this was a church he knew well, and he's in Ephesus. So uh, if we knew our geography well, we'd know that he's just across the Aegean Sea um, in Ephesus from where Corinth is, so he's able to keep in pretty close contact uh, with this church, even though he's in Ephesus. Um, and we know that just before writing this letter, um, Paul had sent Timothy to Corinth 
Uh, he says in 1 Corinthians 4.17, Timothy is going to remind you of my ways in Christ. Uh, we also know from Acts 19.22 that, that Timothy went uh, to Corinth by land, so he went overland uh, through Macedonia, and therefore Paul expected that his letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, uh, would arrive before Timothy got there. That's the impression he leaves in 1 Corinthians 16. So he said, he's written this letter that's to sort of go before Timothy, who will come in person, to continue to instruct them um, of Paul's ways in Christ. Um, and so that's something of the purpose. Uh, Paul had stayed in Corinth, as we said, for a long time during his second missionary journey. This was a church he knew very well. And it seems that towards the end of Paul's stay in Ephesus, uh, Chloe's people, who we read about in chapter 1, uh, people from her household, uh, reported to Paul that the church is being torn apart by various factions in what we might call party strife. Um, and we see that that kind of those party lines being drawn um, already here when Paul says, you know, I hear some of you say I'm of Paul, some I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. And he points out just sort of the absurdity of that. You know, Paul wasn't crucified for you. Um, you know, why would you even say these divisional things? Um, and so there are these reports that come of these party spirits. Obviously, that means some people are following Paul. Um, some people have conjectured that maybe that was people who um, love the contents of the gospel, even though Paul was not, um, as he will kind of defend himself in this letter, not the kind of person who came with, you know, lofty oratory. So maybe these were people who really love the contents of the gospel and not its form. Uh, some were saying, I'm of Apollos. Uh, maybe these were people who loved oratory and who were more concerned with the form of the presentation of the gospel. Uh, some people were saying, I'm of Cephas. That's Peter. Um, maybe this was a group of people who, who liked to adhere to certain ceremonial requirements of the Old Testament, um, such as the kind of thing Peter would maybe be more sympathetic to that Paul points out becomes a problem in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. And some are saying, I am of Christ. And of course, if you're saying I'm of Christ, you're, what you're saying is I'm right and everyone else is wrong. Um, because of course, who, who's going to argue with anyone who says I'm of Christ? Um, as if they were the only ones who had the right uh, distinction. And so there's all these party factions going on in Corinth. We'll read also later in the book, there are reports of a member who was living in open sin with his father's wife, um, and that also other believers were bringing their mutual quarrels to court uh, to have the Gentile courts decide um, on matters between Christians. And so probably about this same time as Chloe's people are bringing these reports to Paul, uh, Paul also received a letter from Corinth, um, probably brought by the three men we read of in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 17, Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. Um, this letter asks him to ad impart advice on several problems, uh, which are very naturally arising uh, when the gospel of light and salvation is making its impact on the low moral life. Uh, that many uh, Gentiles were living to at this point um, in this thoroughly pagan city of Corinth. Um, and so they, they wanted some instructions. How does the gospel inform certain aspects of life uh, among one another? Um, and certain, so accordingly, Paul had to do two things in writing back to them. He had to correct them where this factionalism, where immorality was allowed to reign among certain church members, where their quarrels are being taken to court. He's going to have to correct those things. Um, but he's also going to have to instruct them on all these questions that they've brought to him uh, by way of letter. And so that's what uh, we find by uh, this letter. Probably Paul wrote the letter, as I said, while he was in Ephesus across the way uh, from Corinth, wrote this in answer both to uh, the needs for correction and the needs for instruction. Um, and then he probably sent this letter uh, carried by Titus, Paul's spiritual son, as he calls him in other places, uh, to Corinth with the word from Paul to be followed up by the personal ministry of Timothy. And so really that's what we find in this book. It's a book a lot about correction, correcting things that are gone wrong in the church, um, and also instruction on how the gospel ought to inform the lives of God's people as they live together. And that's why this book is still of great value to us today. There still is a danger of factionalism uh, in the church. There's a danger that party spirits can arise where we begin to say, well, I follow this person or I follow that person. I go this way, I go that way. Um, and Paul writes to say, you know, strife between church members should not be. We all have one 
Lord, we all have one gospel. We all are united under the gospel of Christ and knit into one body. Um, these things should not be. He'll have important instructions to leave the church about discipline, about how believers should settle quarrels among themselves. Really important correction even for the church today. Um, and then also some important instructions. We have uh, all kinds of instructions are given uh, to treat marriage problems, to treat problems with the sacraments, all kinds of things that are going on in the church. So this book is of great value still today um, to point us to the right corrections that the church needs to hear, the right instruction that the church still needs. And what it's a reminder to us is the church is a messy place. And um, sometimes people say, oh, you know, if we can only get back to the first century church where everything was just fine, um, everything was not just fine. Um, everything was not just fine in Corinth. They had tons of problems and tons of problems that will go on. If you read through this book, it sort of makes your mouth drop open that, that people in church could be having these kinds of problems. We're all sinners. We all need correction from time to time. There's a danger in every generation of the church that will break into party factionalism and, and party strife and, and break into different groups in the church. Um, our culture is fracturing all around us. So as a culture fractures into various groups, it's, it's not surprising that that will have an impact on the church as well. And it's a reminder to us, we're to be united under Christ. Uh, we're to be of one mind and one people, not to see a, um, ourselves as, uh, you know, different party groups struggling with one another for dominance, uh, but all those submitting to the will of Christ and to the gospel of Christ um, and living together for our mutual benefit. And so we're going to want to pay attention to this book and see what Paul has to say about corrections that are needed in the church and instructions that are needed. And so hopefully as we go through the outline of the book, we'll help see how Paul outlines some of those things for the church. Uh, but we thank God that we have a Lord Jesus Christ who has brought us in to fellowship with the Father who continues to watch over his church uh, so that we don't consume one another in our petty disagreements and grievances, but that he continues to unite us by his spirit uh, into the gospel of Christ. And may we be the kind of people who seek more and more for that unity and loyalty uh, to Christ and to the mutual edification of his church uh, in the way we interact with one another. So hopefully this book will help us to see how we ought to do that. Let's pray, God, pray to God and thank him for the unity that we have in Christ and the bond of peace we have in his spirit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your church. We thank you for the church in every generation that has been a gathering together of people from various walks of life and different places in the world into one body where we might mutually build one another up. And it is a sad thing when the church falls into party strife and factions. And Lord, we pray that you would keep us from being involved in that. We know that to some degree every church can fall into this trap and, and we are not immune from the things that have plagued your church in ages past. We pray more and more we might seek to be those who want to make peace, to not sow division, but sow unity in the church, that we would live as at peace with one another and build one another up in love so that you might be glorified by a united church, united under Christ our head. And we thank you that when we are failing, that he is faithful, that he will continue to build us up in the most holy faith and knit us together into one body. And so we thank you for the work that Christ is doing by his spirit. And we pray that we might encourage that work more and more in our own lives and never detract from it by our conduct. So help us in these things, we pray. Forgive us our sins. Build us up in Christ, we pray, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, people of God, it's been good to spend this time with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again.